Hello and welcome to BST Live. Glad you could join us today where we're going to be talking about trend trading tactics. So let's get to it. Well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Glad you could join us today. We've got a great topic and an amazing guest, and we're going to be talking about trend trading tactics. So um, we, uh, our guest today is Mr. Brent Penfold. Now, Brent is a full-time trader. He's also an author, an educator, and a licensed futures advisor. Now, Brent became uh, or began his trading career in the early 1980s, so he's very uh, very experienced to be talking about this today and um, we're going to find out what he's doing right now and uh, talk about trend trading as well. So welcome Brent, glad you could join us today. Oh, thank you Andrew and um, many thanks for having me on your live podcast, it's amazing. It has been a while since we've chat, we've uh, spoken, but you have actually been on the the original BST podcast quite a few times and we covered whole range of topics actually but i don't think we focused on trend trading so i'm really excited to be talking about that with you today and um also you've released a trend trading book so i've got some good ideas and some things to uh to ask you and um yeah so uh before we get started though how are you doing you're based in sydney and uh, you don't have any crazy lockdowns as much as we do or we had in melbourne so how have you been coping through all these crazy times uh personally and in the markets as well well, personally, because, you know, I'm at home all the time. Um, when we, in Sydney, when we had the lockdowns for a period of six weeks, it wasn't very long. Mm. Um, it was actually quite good because suddenly I had the, the boys at home, you know, Cardia was home. And I have to say, I, um, I really enjoyed the, the com- companionship because, um, you know, trainings for me is a pretty lonely business. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not really on social media. I don't really talk to people. I, I'm, you know, I'm essentially a hobbit. So initially, <laughs> it was good. It was good. Yeah. But then um, our school that where the boys go to, um, they were very well organised, and, and like a lot of schools, they did the online learning. Yeah, I'm not sure whether you know you have kids, and whether you mm-hmm. have boys. I can assure you, online learning didn't really work for our boys. Right. And, and <laughs> after a while, we thought we can't wait to get the kids, the boys back to school because they, yeah. they just glaze. They just, they just turn off. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and if you're not looking at their Zoom teacher, they're playing Fortnite. <laughs> so initially, a lot of fun. Um, uh, but after a while, it became very aggravating. And we were very pleased in Sydney that they went back quite, quite quickly. Um, yeah. In terms of the market, this has been an extraordinary year in 2020 mm. where we saw the you know, um, sure, we're going to be talking about trend trading today, but yeah. I trade a portfolio of strategies over a portfolio of markets. And so I trade the indices, which have been obviously very, very volatile. And with the 35% flash crash in March, followed by a, like a central bank driven, you know, over 65, 70% rally into um, to new highs. Certainly um, I suffered, my, my indices suffered in yeah. that for sure. Uh, index alert. I've been publishing that since 2014 and I've had losing years before, but um, this year looks like I'll, I'll probably, it's coming, it's coming back now, but I'm still in drawdown on my indices. Yeah. Um, the really pleasing thing and, and something I mentioned to my list when the, all this volatility struck is that the important thing I took from it is the importance of diversification. Yeah. yeah. And, and although the indices have been taking chunks of money out of my account, my boring trend trading has been replacing it yeah. because other markets just keep chugging along yeah. and, and, you know, diversification works. So, yeah. um, you know, it's been terrible for the world. You know, um, it was nice to have the kids here for a while, but that wore thin, <laughs> <laughs> but the kids, are, the kids are gone now. So that's good. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm glad I'm um, as a trader, I'm diversified. I trade multiple you know, strategies, um, they're complementary, yep. um, trend trading, counter trend trading over multiple time frames from short term, medium term, long term. I trade over 34 markets. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, yeah, thanks for explaining that because I think it's um, important to understand um, how you're trading now is that you're trading markets all across, all around the world. And um, 
something that I, and it, as you mentioned, diversified across markets and strategies. Something I find interesting about the way uh, you trade is that you have a preference not to use uh, indicators or, or traditional indicators, which is, I think, is what a lot of traders actually do. Can you explain a little bit about why that is and what you do instead? Sure. That's a, that's a great question um, because it all ties into the unfortunate reality that over 90% of active tr traders lose. Um, now, people may be, be aware of me through my first book, The Universal Principles of Successful Trading, and one of the key messages in that book I, I, I tried to give is that I think um, as traders we need assistance and we need good tools. And in my opinion, the best tools are those tools that are totally independent of you and I and that you and I can have no influence on their interpretation. And what I found, like probably many, many traders, that a lot of indicators are self-fulfilling because mm. you've got so much influence over their outcome that it just, it's like an echo chamber, you know? If you don't like that moving average because you missed out on that fantastic trade, then you'll convince yourself really that moving average was either too short or too long. Yeah. And, and, and you'll, you'll tweak it and suddenly, in your back test, you've captured that wonderful trade. And so um, it becomes self-fulfilling. And so I have a strong preference for tools that have very minimal, if no, variables that, 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 that I can tweak. And, and in a perfect world, a tool that I would use would be able to stand independent of it. And if you or I or the people watching right now were using that same tool, we applied it to the same market, that we should all have the same interpretation of it. Mm. You know, it's got to be black and white. Now, and then we say, okay, perfect, it's independent, does it work? And either it will work or it won't work. And when my book came out, it was very well received. And, and my, my key message was we wanted tools which are, are objective, not tools that are subjective, which basically have these, 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 these variables that you and I can massage, right? And I had a lot of questions, a lot of emails to say, well, can you please give me an example of, you know, what's an objective tool? Mm. And, you know, I sort of answered those the best I could without giving too much away about what I did. And that was probably the reason why I've just published my second book, which is, you know, the universal tactics of successful trend trading. Mm. Because with, my first book, I took a holistic approach to talk about why the process of trading is far more important than any individual markets that you and, you and I trade, it's far more important um, regarding what time frame you and I trade, and it's far more important regarding you know, what instruments you and I trade. I personally think the process of trading is number one. And so I took a very holistic, high-level approach to my Universal Principles book. Yeah, I didn't give a, a, like a practical example of what I was talking about, or not not many, or not enough practical examples, and that's what I've done with my my current book that just just come out last two weeks is to provide examples of um, uh, you know objective tools, uh, and and also I've I've given a pretty good in depth look at why variables are very you know, um, indicators with var variables. Uh, are, are difficult to, to, to manage within a strategy. Now, having said that, I do use indicators. You know, I use the 200-day moving average indicator. It, it gives me an idea of what the dominant trend is. I've been using that for over 30 years. Um, I also use an average true range indicator. But they're basically the only two traditional mm. indicators I use. Um, so I'm not saying you should not use any indicators full stop. I'm saying that we've got to be careful about how many we, we, we use because essentially what happens is the more indicators we have, or more importantly, the more variables we have, the larger the alternative universe of equity curves we have. So any strategy that we develop that has one variable in it we need to know how sensitive that, that, that equity curve is to moves in the variable. Yeah. 
And what that, what that means is that, okay, we have like a, a static, static strategy right now with a static value in the variables and we think that's going to be the strategy we're trading, you know. So that equity curve is in our universe today. But there is a parallel universe to every strategy that has any variables in the methodology because yeah. as soon as you change a variable in your indicator, that will change the shape of your equity curve. And as soon as your equity curve changes, it changes the expectancy. Yeah. And that expectancy will change your risk of ruin calculation. So the more variables you have in your strategy, and depending on how many adjustments you will allow yourself to make to, to, to examine the sensitivity of your strategy to changes in those variables, the bigger, the larger, the wider that universe out there, that virtual universe of alternative <laughs> equity curves are. Right. So, for example, in the book I talk about it, it's a very simple strategy I call retracement trend trainer. Really simple. It only has three indicators. It has two moving average in indicators and it has an RSI indicator. Within those three indicators, there's four variables. Mm. Now, when I do my sensitivity analysis, I allow myself four adjustments to each variable value, two adjustments above my preferred value and two movements below my preferred, preferred value. So if I allow four adjustments to the original value and I have four, indica sorry, four variables in my strategy, I believe I have an alternative universe of 256 different type of equity curves. Mm. And as a, strat as a trader, I need to calculate what the expectancy is of each one of those alternative equity curves and the resulting risk of ruin calculations. And if any of those 256 calculations have a risk of ruin above 1%, I'm not interested. Because mm. even though in my heart of hearts, I believe trading with a 34-day you know, short-term moving average, with a 250-day long-term moving average, and say an RSI with an eight-bar eight, eight look-back period at 80 and, 80 and 20%, even if I believe in my hearts of hearts they are concrete and I'll never change them, history and human nature says <laughs> I will change them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just happens, yeah. you know. And so I can easily jink myself from my current equity curve in my, my real universe here, I'll suddenly slip into one of my alternative equity curves in the alternative universe. Mm. And I just got to pray I'm lucky that that equity curve doesn't result in, a, in, a, in a, an expectancy calculation that will result in a risk of ruin calculation above 0%. Yeah, yeah. So, that's that's why I'm, I'm really um, careful with indicators. And yep. I, so I'll, I'll just rather deal with price. And, and just try and listen to what the market is saying. Yeah. And, 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 and whatever tools I use, I want them to be independent of me. So mm -hmm. I, I, I can have very little influence over what they're telling me. I don't want an echo chamber. And unfortunately, majority of indicators become echo chambers. And they, it just reflects back what you want to see. Yeah, yeah. So you've um, you touched on a number of challenges of trading um, through there. What if we look at um, trend trading specifically? Um, I guess, you know, the concept of trend trading is pretty simple, right? You you detect a trend, you jump in, you hold it till the end, and uh, you, you, you let your, what's, what's it, let, uh, cut your losses short and let your profits run, right? It's It's been around for centuries, that, that concept. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's so hard for traders then if it's such a simple concept? I know. It's like one of the, one of the many paradoxes. In trading, <laughs> yeah, trend trading is the simplest counting one, two, three. The trend is your friend. Cut your losses short and let your profits run. And not only is it really, really simple, the science behind trend trading shows that it works and it's guaranteed to work. Mm. That's the irony. The science says it can't fail. Um, all the empirical studies proves it's there. Some of the best managers in, in the world are trend traders with extraordinary results. Um, 
And yet over 90% of trend traders can't do it successfully. And there's a number of reasons. The number one reason why anyone fails is because their risk of ruin is above 0%. Risk of ruin is made up of two, two inputs. It's, it's your strategy, the expectancy of your strategy, and your money management. When you look at the expectancy in your strategy, a lot of traders trade strategies with fragile equity curves. Hmm. Fragile that once you start changing variable values, the equity curve changes considerably, and usually one of those will have a very poor um, they're very low expectancy, possibly a negative expectancy, which just blows your risk of ruin out. And so they're ignorant of what risk of ruin is and how risk of ruin is calculated. Secondly, trend trading is miserable. It's miserable <laughs> with a capital M. <laughs> because six to seven trades out of 10, you're losing. Markets, markets really trend. And so mm. to be a successful trend trader, you really have to understand risk of ruin and really get um, your money management under control. You know, trend trading is simple. In, in my book, I just I examined 20 strategies and they had their own little, they had, had their own individual interpretations of how to define the trend, how to cut losses short and how to, how to let your profits run. Mm. Um, you know, um, so they've all got their own little different flavours, but the fact is they, they generally all work. But the problem is that um, a lot of people can't experience losing six, seven, eight, nine, ten losing trades in a row. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, I've had a, a losing streak of over 30 losing trades in a row. Hmm. It's terrible. But you've got to keep, keep up with it because a market that you least expect it will suddenly take off and make up for all the pain you have suffered. So one, people generally, they're, they're trading with a risk of ruin above 0%. So mathematically, they're just guaranteed to go broke, mm. right? Bang. Secondly, it is difficult to trade. Even when someone has a positive expect expectancy system, even when somebody has a, a, um, a strategy, once combined with their money management, reduces a risk of ruin of 0%. So even somebody who's very knowledgeable may just find it too hard to, to, to suffer 10 losing trades in a row. Yep. So they give up. And they, and they come back to their strategy six months later only to see the equity curve make a new equity, equity high. So it's just it's difficult because it's, it's miserable. And, mm. um, and also science tells us it's very difficult because – Science tells us trend trading works because markets do not follow a normal distribution. All the academics yeah. will tell us markets follow a normal distribution, which is fancy speak for markets are random. So we can't use past prices to make decisions about future prices. That's academia, right? But when you look at the distribution of markets, you'll find that the, the, regardless of the time frame, there's daily changes in prices, weekly, monthly, quarterly, or even yearly, price changes are not totally random. There's two anomalies within the distribution of markets. They're the fat tails where we see movements of, um, you know, three, three, three standard deviations and higher occurring far more regularly than they should occur if the markets were random. And then you have these really in the middle of your, of, of your distribution, you have, you have what's called thin peaks, where the frequency of um, small changes is way above a bell curve, mm. which implies that, one, me developing a mean reversion strategy, it works. While the fat tails say that trend trading works. Now, for trend traders, to make up a bell curve type distribution, right, even though we're trading for those fat tails, those big moves, you also have to suffer all those other <laughs> little price changes that occur under a bell curve. Yeah. And so it's just, you know, it may look nice, that bell curve or that, distribu that distribution looks nice, and, and we can see those fat tails and we go but both negative and, and positive because in trend trading we can buy and we can sell, and that's what we're chasing is basically the, 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 
we're chasing the trades at the edge of the distributions where we get these big outside moves, right? That's trend mm. trading. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have to suffer through all these little, you know, hundreds of little um, price changes that go nowhere. Yeah. The, um, I have to say, Brent, the way you um, broke that down in, at the start of your book going through the distributions and markets and the whole um, argument against uh, some of the theoretical stuff that's out there, it's probably the best I've ever seen it explained. So I have to congratulate you oh, on thanks. that. Sometimes it can be a bit of a dry topic, but you did really well with that. And, um, but I, wanna, I really want to ask you about the second part of the book, um, which is where you, um, you took some trend-following rules that were published you know, early 1900s, I think even I saw some in the 1800s there, and, um, mm-hmm. and you tested them. And some of those um, ideas are so dead simple, it's like, surely not. There, there must be more to it than that, right? And, mm-hmm. um, yeah, they work even after being published hundreds of years ago. Um, and it really got me how simple this stuff is. Do you think traders just really want to overcomplicate things at times and, Maybe we should just step back and look at some of the classics and take those into our trading. Absolutely. Um, to keep it really simple, in my opinion, the number one attribute for a trading system that we should all embrace and look for is robustness. Mm. Does it work on out of sample data? That's the number one quality that we should all embrace and look for in the strategies that we, we, we trade. Now, one way to develop a strategy is you've got your, your historical data and you can split it in half. And, and maybe you develop your strategy on one half and then you, you leave the other half of the strategy for basically out of sample testing. Mm. You can do that. But I believe, and the key message of my book is we need to look backwards to go forwards because you so you're so true, so correct. For whatever reason, it's part of the way that we're wired, that we believe answers are found in complexity. Mm. We feel that, you know, hope is found in the new ideas. And for some strange reason, we think if we look too far behind us, we must be going backwards, not going forwards. Mm. There are so many contradictions in this world of trading. And I think there is a treasure trove of ideas that were published in the last century and even before. And (laughs) what that gives you and I is the greatest gift any trader can receive, which is out of sample performance. Mm. For example, if a book was published in 1975, um, I use premium data from Norgate. And my data or their data starts from essentially 1979, 1980. So any idea that I read from a book that's published in 1975 and I I, I build up that strategy and and I run it, all the data I have is out of sample. And I'll tell you, since 1980, it has been a a, a roller coaster of financial mm. catastrophes wherever you look. Every time you walk around a building around that corner, share market crash in 1987. Now, in the early 90s, there was the, um, do you remember the savings and loans debacle? And then we had the Asian currency crisis. Yep. And then we had the academics. And we, we had the merchant banks giving all the academics all this money because guess what, you know, markets are normally distributed, you know. We're going to rely on the normal distribution to make us money. And, you know, remember, and, and then um, long-term capital management almost blew up the financial system. Mm. Guess what? Prices and markets do not follow a normal distribution, you know. And then we had the tech crash, you know. And then in, in no, eight we had the, the uh, real estate, the sub, sub-loan, you know, and, and the um, debacle and, and the, 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 um, the financial the, the GFC. Um, and now we've had just volatility everywhere, right? Mm. You could not, not ask for a better data set since 1980 where markets have travelled through every cycle, or every bull market, bear market, through trending, through choppiness, through, um, con- uh, through a contraction in volatility to an, ex- an expansion in volatility, like everything. And so if you go backwards 
and look for an idea, it's going to show you whether the idea is robust because it's had to navigate all of these financial catastrophes over the last 40 years. And that mm. is what will allow you to keep trading a strategy when you're in your drawdown. Because sure, there's no guarantees an idea from 1900 or 1960 or from 1800 will continue to make money tomorrow, but the odds suggest the likelihood is that it will. And because you've run all of this on out of sample data, because the idea is 25 years old, 10 years, or you know, 30 years, 40, 50, 60 years old, it gives you great confidence. Um, now, I know all of these old ideas at one stage was a new idea. <laughs> so people will yep. say, Brent, you're full of, you know, <laughs> you know, you can't be, you can't be you know, negative on all new ideas because what you're talking about now was a new idea 40 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. I understand that. You know what? You and I don't have to be guinea pigs. There is plenty of old, out-of-sample strategies that make money. So we should believe what we see and I think make it a priority that we only trade robust strategies that have evidence of having an edge since they were written about or spoken about or, or published. And um, it's, it's funny, this whole, whole world, you know, um, it is, it, it's really a contradiction trading. Like um, another simple one is that a lot of bright people come into trading, a lot of bright people, mm. and, and they find it really, really hard to succeed because they're looking for the puzzle to that Rubik's Cube and they want to bring their cere cerebral advantage into solving that riddle. And yet it's not how the markets work. Yeah. It's almost like um, you just got to stop trading what you think <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and just believe what has worked in the past and just hope that it will work in the future. And just in case it doesn't, embrace diversification so that in case there is a possible strategy failure, you're okay because you know what? You're not reliant on just one, one idea. And mm. like um, trend trading was first discussed, or the, the key principles by um, David Ricardo, who was an Englishman back in the you know, 1800s. And um, he, his, his three key messages were to his, to his friends were never give up a, a free option when you get one, cut your losses short, let your profits run. So this whole idea of trend trading has been known for over 200 years. <laughs> and, and in the book, I actually program up his simple ideas, you know, and, and that's been known since 1800, <laughs> right, 1800. And, you know, does it make the most money? No, it doesn't. But it's profitable. Yeah. You know, and, and I, you know, this, this, this guy who talked about these ideas, you know, over 200 years ago has an edge over my data since 1980, which is all out of sample at a time, at a period where we had an enormous number of weird things going in the financial markets. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a big stickler for um, em embracing the old. Yeah. I have to admit, Brent, when I was reading that part of your book, I thought, no way this, you know, these trading rules from the 1800s could work. I Prejudged it before I'd even seen the results. I think that's probably a human bias that we all get. But um, yeah, I was really mm. surprised to see that. Um, I don't want to give too much away for the people who who are reading the book, but quite a lot of those techniques still work today, and that was really surprising. I guess um, it it justifies the concept that that continues to work. Um, I've got a question here in the chat actually, uh, which is kind of an extension of that. I'll just put it up on the screen. It's from Jace. Mm. Let me uh, put it up here. G'day, Jace. Thanks for the question. Uh, Brent, do you find that there is evidence of strategy edges eroding as retail software is becoming more available? Oh, <laughs> um, that's an interesting one because, by definition, the the population of traders trading a particular strategy, oh, yeah, the more people who follow a particular strategy, you just a, you have to believe that over time there would be degradation because mm. you've got more people going, you know, um, 
more people jumping on that ship. So a ship gets a bit heavier. The water line comes up and it, it's, it's not as um, safe or as smooth or as fast as, as it used to be. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I don't want to give too much away because I don't, I don't want to give too many spoiler alerts about the book. But it's a great question. And what's interesting is I think what I do, you know, where I look and where I, you know, where I do my stuff, um, I don't know. It um, hasn't impacted me, um, mm. you know. Um, do, you, you know do, you th- do you think that because trend trading is, it tends to be more longer term than other particular styles, that maybe that's, that helps with the longevity of the concept? Well, I think you're right, yes. I think because it's so hard for the average retail trader, one, because of um, the ignorance of risk of ruin, mm. they just, they're guaranteed to go bust. And secondly, it's very difficult to, you know, um, trade, you know, suffer 10 losses or 20 or 30 losses in a row that knocks people out. That you only find the institutions, uh, basically, they're, they're the biggest players in trend trading, the, the institutions. And, and really, trend trading, um, you know, the results have for some uh, really uh, well-known strategies have been difficult over the last, you know, five years. They, they have been. Um, um, but they've just recently made new equity highs. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's, it's a, very, it's a legit, legitimate question. And by definition, the more people that, you know, jump on that boat, we'll, we'll see that boat sink a bit and its performance would slow down. But it hasn't impacted me, and I think it's, as you say, a lot of people can't trend trade. They find it too hard. Mm. And in my book, I talk about what, what is the appeal of trend trading for me, which I hope is going to be the same for the reader. And, and, and one of those reasons was it's durable. You know, it's over 200 years old and it's still making money today. So that's a big tick. <laughs> and then my last reason why I say it's, it's wonderful is because it's dead set hard. <laughs> it's hard, you know. One, retail traders don't have the interest in working out what the risk of ruin is and understanding the implications of that. And secondly, people, people can't be involved in an enterprise where the continual feedback is negativity. You've lost. You've lost. You're wrong. You're stupid. You're a knucklehead. You know, you're dumb. Losing. People can't handle that. And, and, and so, you know, on the retail level, there's probably not a lot of trend traders and, and maybe that's what may you know help the edge maintain uh, continue but then i know the majority of trend traders are the institutions where there's billions of dollars behind it yeah um you know i, I think i think trend trading it's so durable it'll con- it will continue to be durable um and it's i think yeah, it's funny the academics can't justify why trends exist <laughs> There's a new theory on the block called behavioural finance and path dependency, and they try and come up with an idea of why trends persist, why they exist and why they persist. And I think, I think it's because of one of the reasons is human nature, you know, doesn't believe prices should be so high. Yeah. And so everyone's looking to sell the top and sell the top and sell the top, um, and yet that keeps fueling the trend because, you know, suddenly these people who are caught on the wrong side think, oh, it's going higher, and they jump on. You know, they've been stopped out, but they jump on and they, they, they fuel it to continue to move higher and higher and higher. So, um, you know, the human nature probably assists trends because we're, 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 slow, we're slow to um, comprehend news and yeah. we're slow to, to accept what we're, what we're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny with uh, trend following because I guess, I don't know, maybe every 10 years or 20 years or five years, you know, trend following goes through a, a rough period and you see out in the media, oh, trend following's dead. It's never coming back. And then you know, it always seems to find its way way back. And uh, I think that goes to what you were just saying there, that it's been going on for so long and it will probably continue to go on because it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, human behavioural behind it. and um, but what I wanted to ask you is for retail traders who are doing trend following and they may be struggling, maybe they're going through a, a rough patch as well, what do you think they should look at or where should they focus to 
uh, try and make that a bit easier for themselves. Sure. Um, please get an understanding of what risk reward is and, and understand how you can measure it. Okay. Um, people aren't stupid. Once they have the knowledge, they'll suddenly know it's like, you know, joining the dots. So understand what risk of ruin is and what your two chief weapons are against risk of ruin, which is expectancy, which is your strategy, and then money management. Money management's an easy one to fix. You just got to trade small, really, really small. You just got to trade tiny, 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 tiny. Secondly, um, expectancy is, is your strategy. Um, you got to look for strategies that have as many attributes of winning systems that you can. In my experience, winning strategies have two key attributes. They're measurable. They have clearly defined rules. So you can actually run an historical back test to do all your mathematical calculations for expectancy and risk of ruin. And secondly, they're robust. And people should focus more on robustness you know, the way I'm trading, is it robust? You know, is it robust? Robustness, there's, there's, two, there's two ways to gauge robustness. One is evidence. And that is, when was the idea published? And so you've got all that out-of-sample performance. Hmm. And that's, that's black and white. That's, that's just gold, 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 gold. You, you, you can't deny it. It either works or it doesn't. If they feel that they've got some super edge, and, and they've got an interesting idea, why not, you know, code it up. But you should look for evidence of robustness if you're going to trade a new idea. Mm. And evidence of robustness comes in two ways. One is versatility. All robust strategies are versatile. They're profitable across a universal, universal portfolio of markets. So the idea is don't just develop a strategy on, you know, five markets or five you know, six markets, even though, you can, even though you can only afford to trade four markets or five markets, you've got to do your testing over a, uni, a universal portfolio of as many markets that are representative of the markets, multiple sectors and you know, multiple markets within those sectors. So even though you're only, only going to trade, say, four markets as a trend trader because you can't afford to trade any more than four markets, make sure your strategy has an edge or it's versatile over a broad portfolio, because that's a key sign of robustness. Mm. Another key sign of, or, or, or indication of robustness is you have to follow simple design principles. And all that means is less is more. Have less indicators. Please have less variables. We talked about that earlier. Try and have identical rules for both your buy setups and your sell setups across all markets, i.e. have a homogeneous setup, right? Don't have an interest rate setup. Don't have an an index setup. Don't have a a corn setup. You know, make sure the setups are homogeneous and make sure your setups are symmetrical. Don't make them asymmetrical. You know, your buy setup should just be the reverse of your sell setup or your sell setup should be a reverse of your buy setup. So, they're good design principles, um, so I encourage them to, um, you know, be sensible on how they, you know, develop their strategy or, you know, either look for robustness or if they want to go off by themselves, um, try and adhere to good design principles. And then once you want to start trading, trend trading, most traders are small traders and they can't afford to trade a portfolio of markets. Now, a small trend trader will run the risk that they will suffer underperformance because even though they're trading a strategy that has, has been known for 200 years, it's got great pedigree, trend trading. It's got the science behind it. Science proves it can't lose, right? Re- reality says a small trader can't afford to trade 15 markets or 20 markets or 30 markets, right? And so when you start trading, say, a small portfolio of four markets or eight markets or 12 markets, whatever it is, you do suffer the risk of underperformance. And, and you, just have to, you just have to accept that, right? 
Mm. Secondly, small traders can suffer falling into the classic trap of data mining where they've got a portfolio of, say, 24 or 30 markets or 40 markets. They can only afford to trade, say, four markets. And what they do is they pick the best performing markets out of their four markets. Well, I can almost guarantee that today's winner will be tomorrow's loser. But smaller traders don't realise that. They look at the historical equity curve of a particular market out of their portfolio of markets, and they, they'll just naturally pick the best performing ones. So that's a real trap for mm. um, small traders. And my, my, my advice is that um, what I do is when I pick, when I pick my markets, I ensure there's diversity. Now, I, I'm a futures trader. So I trade off the, um, the, the, the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. It's the biggest futures exchange in the world. It's got the most liquidity. It's got the cheapest brokerage. Um, it's got fantastic historical data, and you've got eight sectors. It's diversified. You've got your interest rates, your currencies, your metals, your energies, your softs, your grains, your meats. It's all there. I only trade the three markets within each sector that has the highest average daily volume. Mm-hmm. So I use diversity and liquidity as my criterion to pick my portfolio of markets. So I have no influence. I don't cherry pick which are the best markets. Now, my strategies may be fantastic on orange juice, but I don't trade orange juice because the volume's rubbish, you know? I, um, so for a small trader, they should embrace um, you know, diversity and liquidity. If you have share traders there, um, there's a whole bunch of sectors on a whole bunch of um, share markets. They should just, you know, um, look to trade maybe just the most liquid you know, share within a particular sector. That's all they can afford to do. Or sorry, mm. uh, most liquid, yeah, share within a sector. So it's, ensure there's diversity and don't go for your favourite company. Go for the one with the most liquidity. Mm. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, now, I can't, I can't give too much away, but um, um, there also is uh, another way of um, doing it for small traders that uh, I've developed. And I will be teaching that. I've got a workshop coming up in a couple of weeks. I will be teaching it. It's a strategy or methodology I call I call uh, portfolio X cube. That is a independent way of um, selecting a micro portfolio that ensures diversity and liquidity. Um, and without blowing my own trumpet, it's unbelievable. It's a very simple idea, but it's unbelievable. If we believe that trend trading performance degradates with fewer markets as compared to more markets, this approach I use, if you look at a strategy, which I think is probably one of the best strategies um, available today, like it's, it's publicly known, it's, it's, it's um, Richard, Richard Don, uh, Donchian's four-week rule. And it's a great strategy. It's only got one rule. And it, it's always in the market and it'll always, you know, go, go stop and reverse and go long on a four week breakout and it'll go, it'll stop, get stopped out and go short on a four week breakout to the low. So it's always in the market. It's been known since 1960 <laughs> and like a lot of trend trading methods, it has suffered recently it just um, over the last five, seven, eight years, but it's now at a new equity high. So that's like 60 years. 60 years making the equity high. Now, with this, if, uh, with this methodology I have, which says, if a trader says, I can only afford to trade, um, you know, say four markets over a portfolio of, say, 24 on a really long-term trend trading strategy that has enormous stops, right? When you trade a four-week breakout and your stop is the opposite four-week breakout, we're talking about like, you know, six, 7% stops, huge stops, right? It does really well. It has a rising equity curve. You actually think somebody trend trading only four markets with a long-term strategy um, would, would, would suffer, suffer greatly or the equity curve would be really rough, right? Really rough. But, um, yeah, I, I do have a method that allows a trader with a small amount of capital to basically, um, you know, 
follow these rules and it, it does create a dynamic portfolio. The portfolio keeps changing. That's a trick. That's, that's, that's the key is that um, you don't want to just trade yesterday's best markets because yesterday's best markets don't become today's best markets. So there's got to be some rotation within your portfolio. But the key is you can't have more than four markets or you can't have more than six markets or you can't have more than eight markets in that portfolio. And you must take the signals for that market in that current month. Um, mm. But if, 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 um, if you don't know how I do it, then certainly embrace just diversification and liquidity and that will go a long way to helping a small trader. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Brent. Now, there's been quite a few questions and comments in the chat, so I might just uh, share some of those with you now and go through a few before we wrap up for today. So um, here's a question from Jack. Let me just put it up on the screen. G'day, Jack. Thanks for the question. Here it comes. Oh, the text is quite small on my screen. What are your thoughts on trade dependency for trend systems? I find many of my trend systems have different return distribution depending on if the last trade was a winner or a loser. It's a fantastic question, Jack. Um, trade dependency, um, you may have heard of um, uh, Linda, Linda um, uh, I've forgotten the last name, she, she had a strategy called Turtle Soup, Rushkey. which is a lot of breakouts or false breakouts. Mm. And so um, with trend trading, because trends don't, don't exist all the time, um, I found, like no doubt you, you have found, that there is, um, there is a lot of trade dependency between, between um, signals. And what I have found, and it's been really um, useful to me, is that if a previous signal on one of my strategies not all of them, but on, on, on a good, good some of my strategies. If a, stra if a previous signal was a, a profitable signal, I won't take the next signal. Mm. Because markets have rotation. They do rotate. They do mean revert. And, and unfortunately, you know, not every market will just keep trending, 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 and trending. So a lot of breakouts are false breakouts. And so um, you know, I, I find as a filter, it's a very valuable filter to, um, and it may not suit all strategies. I personally find it's, it's, a, it's a, um, a wonderful value add to what I do. Um, but people should look at um, when they're running the, the, the strategies is to put a little filter in there and say, okay, what happens if I only take a signal if the previous signal is a loss? And, and certainly from my experience, um, that is a, a powerful value add to, to trend trading. Okay. Thanks, Brent. Um, here's a question from Ola. Ola's a regular. Thanks for the question, Ola. Just put it up on the screen. It is typical that one or two trades increase their proportion of the portfolio and contribute hugely to the overall risk. How do you control increased risk? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Olga. Ola. Um, Certainly, unfortunately, not every futures contract has, has, has the same value the, um, compared to its neighbour. So each market has its own different volatility. Um, um, each market has its own dollar value per, per tick size. Um, you know, um, unfortunately, our markets aren't homogeneous. They're all a little bit different. And sometimes you can have... Um, in your portfolio, suddenly, if you trade indices like I do, and if you trade the DAX and uh, the uh, E-mini NASDAQ, they're volatile and they have a big impact on your results. All you can do, or what I do, is just ensure my money management ensures my position sizing rep represents um, the, the maximum amount of money I want to lose if I'm wrong. So my money management helps me in saying, um, I've got to believe Whenever I trade, and I talk about this in my books, I always expect to lose. So I'm always going to debit my, my penal spreadsheet with my expected loss before I trade. And I'm not going to, I, I, I try and reduce my risk to about half a percent on each trade. And um, that's what dictates um, my, my armor. Having said that, you know, I'll still take those signals and suddenly, you know, you, you have a, a mini NASDAQ contract sitting in your portfolio 
next to a five-year treasury note. And it's like having, you know, a David <laughs> and Goliath in your portfolio. Um, yeah. You know, now if, if um, Goliath wants to give me a hard time, hey, fine, I'll lose half a percent, sometimes three quarters of a percent. But that's all I'm going to lose, you know. Um, and similarly, David's tiny, but, you know, if, if he gets knocked out, he'll still cost me half a percent. So money management is what's going to allow you to normalise the risk of these different markets as they come into your portfolio. Mm, yeah. I've got a question here from Ilya, which is kind of, oh, sorry, were you going to say something, Brent? You look like you're about to say. No, no, it's okay. No. <clears throat> I've got a question here from, I think it's pronounced Ilya. Um, which is an extension of what you were just saying then. Let me just put it up on the screen. And by the way, Ilya has been contributing a lot to the chat today, so thank you very much for your comments there. Um, so how do you size your trades, which you were just talking a little bit about then? Um, I've seen, uh, sorry, I've seen a lot of sources saying use a constant vol size across markets, but doesn't that punish strong trends but get smashed in calm sideways markets? I, I just size my trades on my money management. I I treat all signals equally. I don't care if it's five year notes, the E mini, um, Nasdaq, the DAX. You know, I treat every signal uh, equally, and it's my money management that does the, the sizing. Um, I trade futures. Um, I don't trade shares, but it'd be similar for shares. You know, um, all you can afford to lose is a, or depends on what approach you use for money management. I use a um, fixed percentage and I don't want to lose, you know, more than half a percent, sometimes, you know, three quarters. But then on a portfolio basis, I don't want to lose more than five or six percent if, if it goes sideways on me. So I, I, I have a lot of, um, I trade a lot. Um, mm -hmm. It all comes down to, you know, each individual market will have its own um, individual risk profile. It's, it's going to be a function of your strategy, which is where's your entry, where's your stop. You know, what's the dollar risk per, per, per position? How many positions can you put on given your money management approach? How much of your risk capital are you prepared to risk on any one individual trade? Yes, I know when I look at the tops of the trees, some trees are huge and some are small. But when I'm trading, all I see is trunks, you know, and I've got to chop that one down, chop that one down, chop that one down. I've got to take all these, remove all these, you know, these new setups. And regardless of how tall they are, and, and I use my money management to normalise, um, to bring them down to the same level. And it's just position sizing. Mm, yeah. Thanks, Brent. So we've got a question here from Club Ham. I'm going to put up on the screen. We did already talk about this one, so we don't need to answer that. But um, trend following strategies have deep drawdowns. What am I doing wrong? I don't know. Do you want to comment on that? You're doing very well. <laughs> drawdowns are part and parcel of trading. I'm always in a drawdown. Um, you know, congratulations, you're a trend trader. Um, <laughs> if they're really, really deep, I would say just have a look at your money management. If, if, if you're happy with your strategy and your strategy has a positive expectancy and it doesn't have a fragile equity curve, you haven't got a huge universe of alternative equity curves, i.e. you've got very few you know, variables that you can tweak. If you're, if you're happy with, with the expectancy, then um, two things. Or, yeah, two things. One, look at your money management. You could be over trading if, if you feel it's too deep for yourself. Secondly, look at your portfolio construction. Make sure it's, it's diverse across sectors. Um, you don't want to have any concentrations. Um, some people may think, you know what, I've got limited risk capital. Maybe I'll just trade the small futures contracts or I'll just trade the, um, the futures contracts with the lowest margin, right? Lowest margin. I'd rather be only have $2,000 pulled out of my account rather than having $30,000 pulled out of my account. Um, you, could, you could do that in live trading. The only problem is you should trade what you test. So in one respect, that's a, that's a natural thing to do is, you know what, um, if, if your drawdown is too deep financially and you're happy with your strategy, then look at your money management approach, i.e. reduce your position sizing if you can. If you can't do that, then look to trade the smaller futures contracts, the ones which have the low overnight margin, and you'll find, therefore, they'll have less impact on your account, right? Hmm. 
But unfortunately, that won't help you because you should be trading what you test. And um, if, you, if you can manage to test a strategy that's based on what the lowest margin futures contracts were historically, and have confidence that your strategy in you know, 1980 and 1990 and the year 2000, year 2010, all the signals are picked up, you're only trading the, it's called on the small futures contracts, um, that's fantastic. And so that means, and, and, and if the equity curve looks good, then that's how you trade. You trade contracts with small margins. Um, but unfortunately, not many people can do that. We don't really, because markets change, volatility changes, margin, requ margin requirements change. So it's pretty hard to do that if you could. Yeah, why not trade, trade the uh, smaller margins? Um, but um, please don't worry, be worried about drawdowns. It's part and parcel of trend trading. I'm in drawdown all the time. You know, it's just how I, how I exist. You mm. know what? I know I'm trading with um, a 0% risk of ruin. You know, I can have a thousand, oh, that's an exaggeration. I can have like a hundred losing trades. And I know I'll still have risk capital to take the next trade. And I know, you know, um, no certainty because you can't, no one's, no one's got a crystal ball. I know the odds are that the way I trade and hopefully the way you trade has worked in the past and in all probability it will work tomorrow. And as long as it embraces the th three, you know, um, you know, golden, golden rules of trend trading, which is trade with the trend, cut your losses short, let your profits run, you will eventually enjoy a new equity high. But you've got to survive in the meantime, and you do that yeah. by trading small, small, small. Yep, yep. Thanks, Brent. I've got a question here from Douglas. Uh, I know you've gone into how you choose your markets, but this one uh, touches on a, uh, a technique I know a lot of traders use, and that is to uh, – actually, let me just read it. So it's generally, gen generally <laughs> well accepted that some instruments trend and others revert to the mean. Do you have a systematic way to select those that trend for your trend following systems? Um, my only, no, no, I've just basically got a, a universal, a large portfolio of 24 markets, which I call my universal portfolio. And I, I just know the science behind trend trading works that, that markets do experience trends. I just don't know when. And I just don't know which markets will trend. And so I trade them all. Like on some of my strategies, the indices don't make money, haven't made money over um, 40 years. Do I take those signals? Yes, I do take those signals because you just don't know what's going to happen next year. It may decide to trend. Um, so and, and, um, I, do have a, I do have an approach on portfolio construction I mentioned for smaller traders, which I think is um, very clever. It's very simple. I think it's very clever to help people in constructing a, a small portfolio um, that does make deliberate, deliberate decisions about which markets to trade. But you have to start off with a pool of markets, you know, a pool of markets. And, and how I select my pool of markets, I am systematic because I go for diversification, or well, you know, diversity, and then I go for liquidity. No, I don't go back and say which markets perform the best on my strategies and just trade those. You know, um, my, my, my strategies and my, my portfolio are, are arms apart. They're, they're not connected um, because no one's got a crystal ball. Um, um, nobody knows which markets are going to trend. And nobody knows which markets will revert to the mean. But the mathematics, the science says Prices are not randomly dis um, distributed. Prices do not follow a normal distribution. There are thin peaks, which means mean reverting strategies work, and there's big fat tails at the end, which tells us that trend trading works. Unfortunately, I certainly haven't found anything that will give me a heads up about um, which markets are more likely to trend and which won't. But I will say this. There is probably only one really, 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 really reliable cycle that um, you know I've found in the markets, and it's something that Larry Williams um, uh, ta taught me back in the mid '90s. 
and, and it's purely volatility that he didn't mention it like volatility, but he just said, you know, um, basically large bars, large bars, daily bars will follow small daily bars. And then, you know, um, small daily bars will follow large daily bars. Because markets expand and they contract. And that's just volatility. And that's a very reliable um, cycle that, that volatility will contract and expand, contract and expand. The frequency is not reliable. <laughs> Um, yeah. And one of the reasons why I got into trend trading was that in 2007, I'm not sure if you remember, but in 2007, the markets were, the, uh, the indices were experiencing really low daily volatility. And, and I was in a drawdown in my indices. And I knew I was, in a, I was in, a, in a drawdown because basically volatility had vanished. And something I realized I had to diversify into strategies, you know, away from my um, index trading because that was pr- predominantly um, you know, mean reverting strategies. And they work very well when there's high volatility. But when there's low volatility, they don't work very well, you know, believe me. And that's what encouraged me to diversify into trend, trend trading. So um, that's, a, that's a, a, phenom- a phenomenon in the markets that people may look to investigate to maybe help them decide which markets they should trade and what they shouldn't trade maybe not trade those markets that have experienced an explosion of volatility because they usually followed by low volatility. But then the risk is that um, trending markets generally trend under low volatility, if that makes sense. Falling markets usually fall under rising volatility. So there's a couple of, you know, um, you know layers running through that. Mm-hmm. Um, but unfortunately, the only systematic way I've found of Picking a portfolio is based on diversity and um, liquidity, and I've got no idea which markets are going to trend and which are going to be mean revert. And, and if I did, I'd be taking Andrew to the south of France and we'd be you know, <laughs> living it up. It'd, it'd just be like an ATM, wouldn't it? Ah, that's going to mean <laughs> revert. That's rallied. I'll sell that. And uh, ah, that's about the trend. I'll buy that. It'll just be, you know, too easy. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because we just got a question from BK in the chat saying, do you have a mechanism to funnel your cash between trend following and mean reversion? And um, it sounds like you don't have your crystal ball oh, yet. So that, that, That's a great um, – basically, I trade a portfolio of strategies, okay? Yep. Um, I think I trade over like 18, 18 models um, within my portfolio, over 34 markets, and um, they're all – Diverse and complementary, in in you know the, the two main ones is either is a trend trading or counter trend, you know trend trading or mean reversion. They're the two um, techniques, um, and I, I diversify over times. You know my indices are essentially mm-hmm. short term, you know, um, and then I have medium term and longer term, um, and I do it over. I throw a huge blanket over the. I trade thirty four markets, and um, and 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 so what I um, sometimes or a lot of the times. I will get multiple signals in the same market on the same day. But my money management technique says I can only afford to risk X percentage in a particular market on any day. And so I will not take all my signals if they're all going the same way on the same market. And what I do is I I only put in my order for the signal that's going to trigger first. Yeah, so you just basically run your strategies as a portfolio over your portfolio and make sure when you're doing your hist- historical analysis that you eliminate duplicate trades, right? So you may have 10 strategies that you trade, half a, a, a trend trading, half a mean reversions. You're trading it over the same universal portfolio, and I hope you do. Even if you don't trade 40 markets or 20 markets, on your testing, you want to make sure your ideas are versatile, that they work across a broad portfolio, because that ensures that you, that you don't fall into the trap of data mining. Um, that you might have ten strategies, you know, and 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 a couple may trigger for whatever reasons the same same directional trade on the same day. Well, you just make sure that when you go through your your back testing software, that you can eliminate duplicate trades and you take out the trades which are triggered later. So if I've got three trades, 
you know, um, where's the S&P 30? Say, say, the S&P, so say if I had three buy orders on the S&P uh, right now, one could be at 3,600, one could have, have me buying at 3,620, and one could be, have me buying at 3,640. Mm. Well, guess what? I would eliminate the 3,620 and the 3,640, regardless of whether it was mean reverting or trend trading, I just take the signal that gets triggered first. Yeah, that's very important. Mm, okay. Thanks, Brent. Now, I'm conscious we're over time, but there's a couple of questions here, so maybe we can do like a quick fire yeah, no kind of thing here. Just so. so there's one from Philip here. I think we touched on this maybe. Philip, g'day, Philip. You talk about trading futures. Would your systems work on stocks in the ASX top 500, for example? Great question. I can't say with authority whether my ideas, my strategies work on CFDs or shares, okay, because I don't tr trade. I invest in shares, I don't trade shares, and I don't trade CFDs. So I can't say for sure. However, what I will say is that um, what, how, how I trade simple and my ideas I use are very old ideas and um, I trade a universal portfolio and I would imagine that they would have legs on, you know, BHP, on, on the big freely traded markets on the ASX. I'm not sure I, I wouldn't want to trade them on the, the penny dreadfuls. But <laughs> if you can, you know, trade really liquid um, large cap markets where no individual player can influence prices, you know, you want to trade, you know, a, a free and fair market, then I would suspect my stuff would have an edge because um, I know it's simple, the ideas are old, and really um, a lot of the old ideas don't come from futures trading. They come from trading the US markets, which over 100 years ago there weren't futures. They were share traders. And so, you know, I've probably just pinched ideas from equities and I just use them in futures. But I don't trade uh, shares, so I can't say for sure. But um, I'd be surprised if they, if they didn't have an edge. Okay. And one final question that's just popped up from Adam T. G'day, Adam. Let me put it on the screen here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you test your strategies against all markets and pick the winners to trade live? That's a fantastic question. And no, I don't. <laughs> because unfortunately, that um, what you're referring to is a classic trap that everyone falls into, and, and, and what you're referring to directly is called data mining. It's like cherry picking, um, that you're only looking to trade yesterday's winners because they look attractive. I understand that. I've probably done that in the past. Um, but you can't do that because, um, you know, we do have a, a, re a regency biasness in our heads, and so what we see yesterday we think will um, extrapolate for tomorrow. Um, no, I don't. And I mentioned before that um, for a lot of my trend trading systems, they don't make money on the NASDAQ or the, uh, the E-mini NASDAQ or the E-mini S&P trend trading. My, my mean reversion strategies make a lot of money, but not trend trading. But I still take the S&P and the NASDAQ trades on my trend trading. So I don't know which markets is going to trade. And we had, a, we, had, we had an earlier question, a really good question about trade dependency, about... Um, you know, trade dependency, if you get a, negative, a, a positive trend result, does that mean you're going to get another positive trend result or a negative trend result? Well, my experience is that um, it's, it's a really good filter for trend trading strategies is only take the current signal if the previous signal was a loss. And that's, that's a great value add for what, I, for what I do personally. And that would run contrary to what you're looking at is maybe only tr trading the winners. So um, uh, I wouldn't, I would not encourage it. Um, and it's not what I do. Um, uh, but, but you know, you may find different. But I, I just think when you when you when you look to just trade yesterday's winners, it's 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 risky, and and, and you and you're taking a couple of large strides down that bad path of what's called data mining. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Brent. We've gone a little bit over time now. So um, 
I really appreciate you being generous with your time here today. So if people want to learn more from you or get in touch with you, how can they do that? Where can they go? I, they can just find me on my website, um, which is uh, indextrader.com.au. Uh, um, yeah, they can um, jump on there and they can contact me via the website. And I'm, you know, I had, I had problems with my emails this morning, as I mentioned to you, but that's all <laughs> resolved now. I, I haven't, you know, it's all working now. Yeah. Um, so that's good. And, um, you, you know, there's, they're, they're, you know, I'd encourage them to um, have a look at my books. Because really, stuff I talk about is in my books. Um, yeah. And but yeah, certainly come to the website and and they, they can contact me via via it. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I recommend the books as well. The trend uh, trading book is really good, but I think the Universal Principles is like a classic. I think it's timeless. The the stuff you mentioned in there is timeless and applies to all traders. So if you haven't read that one, mm. absolutely get that. That's a that's really uh, very valuable information you're sharing there. So um, thank you very much, Brent. Now, next week, um, oh, actually, you mentioned workshop before. Did you want to say anything about that? When is it? What is it about? Oh, yeah, I'm running a, a workshop um, on the 28th to 29th of November. It's a, an online, you know, COVID safe <laughs> workshop. Yep. And um, it will be a trend trading workshop. I'm going to be teaching my universal trader strategy, which is basically a portfolio of four strategies all the strategies have over 10 years 10 years of out of sample performance um, and once people learn what those strategies are they will realize strategies actually have much much more out of sample performance and um, yeah, it's going to be basically a, a trend trading masterclass uh, uh, during my workshop but all that information is on my is on my website yep Yep. All right. Thanks, Brent. And now uh, next week we've got a special guest who's going to be Scott Andrews. And I think the topic is uh, how to find edges, but I didn't write it down on my notes here. Again, that's the second week in a row, so I need to tidy up my uh, act there. But, yeah, Scott Andrews, same uh, time and day. So that's uh, Sunday evenings, 7 p.m. Central US. So hopefully to see you there. Thanks again for everyone who has attended today. We've had some really great discussions in the chat. And um, thank you again, Brent, uh, for attending. And I just actually, before we go, uh, I'd just like to remind people who have attended or if you're watching the replay, if you enjoy it, please um, like and subscribe and share it with all your trading buddies because everything that uh, Brent has shared with us today is super valuable and we want it we want to get the message out to everyone. So um, thanks for everyone for attending. We've got some thanks here in the chat as well. Let me just put up a couple, Brent, just to finish off on a high. So Adam T, who asked about um, picking the winners, uh, says thanks. And uh, BK says thanks. A lot of wisdom. So, yeah, thanks again, Brent, and um, take care, and I wish you all the best. Okay, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. All the best with your trading. Cheers.